This is AIGA. We believe design inspires the world, especially when we inspire each other. As designers, we are more versatile than ever before, and our work has unprecedented power to influence everything around us. When we work together, we learn from each other, we support each other, and we inspire each other. Together, we are stronger than we could ever be on our own. And only together can we ensure that everyone, not just designers, but everyone in business, government, the media, and the public, understands the potential of design to change everything. We are AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. so much what an introduction uh mike there was not one sports metaphor in that i am tremendously disappointed i'm canadian i'm sorry that's like the most perfect quote i've ever heard all right let's uh initiate huh. how about we start at the beginning not the end huh guys all right, the name of the talk, Super Connected. Um, actually not gonna be talking that much about scripts tonight. It's like every time they ask you to speak somewhere, I want to deliver some fresh content. So uh, the old talk was called Super Connected. It's mostly about script typefaces, how they connect and that sort of thing. But that stuff is like a year old now. So I worked on something fresh for you all. Quick note for the future, the end of every talk ends in a very awkward silence when no one's quite brave enough to ask a question. Uh, so we are going to navigate around that this evening and we have trivia questions. You can choose between typography related trivia or Stevie Wonder related trivia. Um, and then winners, if you did the question correctly, you can get a free poster and uh, losers will be booed off stage. <laughs> Let's get into it. Thank you to AIGA for hosting me. This is a fantastic opportunity. I love traveling places and doing the workshop thing, meeting you all, mingling it up. Um, it's a lot of fun for me. We got my girlfriend, Sadie, in the crowd. We got Aunt Chrissy in the crowd tonight. Yes! So, so we're making the most of it over here. Can anybody find the hidden penis in this lettering? Which one? Which one? Aunt Chrissy, you're killing it. It's right here. Keep it moving. Um, I always wondered why when you take a class or something, uh, teachers don't generally lead off with like why the students should be there. Um, because you find yourself in very obscure situations, weird classes, and no one really takes the time to explain why it could be possibly beneficial to you. So I wanted to do that with you right here before we go any further. Why are you here? Is it possibly be, uh, for some inspiration? Um, I think there's been enough inspiration. You might be too inspired as it is. Uh, a, a couple minutes on Pinterest and you're overwhelmed. So yeah, probably not on it, uh, inspiration so much. Is it for motivation? Um, again, enough motivation in the world. We're over it. We need no more posters about it. Uh, probably not that. But education, I think, is something that's, that's getting more in line with what we're trying to do here. Um, and really what it comes down to is curiosity. At some point in my education, I had a teacher that said, curiosity is the big enchilada. And I love that quote so much. Uh, it's such a gift to be curious about anything. And whenever you have that, I would always encourage anyone to explore that curiosity as deeply as possible. And it's pretty infinite how deep you can go with, with certain curiosities. 
So I appreciate you all so much for being here and expressing some of your own curiosity. I'm sure you weren't really sure what you were going to get tonight. Uh, frankly, I'm not either, but we'll see where this goes. Again, about motivation, I want to motivate you to do less with your lives. Um, I think we're kind of obligated to do too much as it is. Graphic designers in particular are expected to wear so many hats these days, and it's just insane. It wasn't so long ago that these were all individual careers, basically. And of course, in addition to that stuff, you're expected to be all these things as well. Um, and then some asshole comes along and says, oh, and side projects is, <laughs> is what you're supposed to be doing. So yeah, I, I'm going to encourage you all to uh, do less with your time and uh, focus a little more, maybe. Why am I here, personally? The answer is very simple. I am looking to buy Canson marker paper at cost. If any of you have hookups at the Canson Paper Company, get in touch. I love their products. Also, I'm looking for more followers on my vertical storage pin board. I am passionate about vertical storage. I think uh, it has a lot of potential to increase the quality of everyone's lives. That's why I invented the slogan, vertical storage, do it your shelf. Uh, someone went like, oh. All right, uh, here's the background information about myself. I was thinking, before we talk about myself, we should talk about myself. Uh, greetings from San Francisco, that's where I'm from. I'm also interested in honesty, okay? So this is a, a transparent operation going on between us. I'm not only going to show you the ideal versions of things, this is also San Francisco. I've never seen a homeless person look more relaxed than this guy. Um, I have five older brothers. Here I am dreaming of fonts from a very young age. Check out my, my brother Georgie here. He's still an asshole, if you're wondering. I uh, grew up skateboarding in California. And you're not cool unless you got your friend underneath you. <laughs> he gets as close to the ramp as he possibly can. Uh, if you're wondering if I landed it, I definitely didn't. <laughs> Early lettering attempts, huh? I did not quite know to erase the pencil at this stage in my lettering career. But this is kind of where I got my start, was doing these little uh, images for a real estate directory website. So if I say a directory website that kind of gives you a loose idea on the time frame, these things don't really exist so much anymore. But I didn't do just one. I did plenty. <laughs> this is what I refer to as the bowels of graphic design. But uh, a, a very nice place to begin, in a way. You get to experiment with different typefaces and learn Photoshop and play with hierarchy and stuff like that. So even though it is garbage, uh, it was educational. And a number of great mustaches in here, I got to say. <laughs> I attended college at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, which is a wonderful school. And this was the sort of lettering stuff I was doing at that time. So if you are embarrassed about your current lettering work, I would say fear not. Uh, it, it gets better. I'm going to start the It Gets Better campaign for uh, beginner letters. And yeah, this is just bad stuff. You could tell that these were supposed to be full fonts. I like, had the idea that I was going to flesh out the entire character set. But I'd often get about five letters in before I decided um, I hated whatever I was working on. Somewhere in school, I had a project called The Woods of Wisdom. We were assigned a 50-part poster series. That was the only requirement for the project. We had to do a poster series that was that 50 installments. That's like insane to think about 50 of anything. It's very difficult. Uh, so I did The Woods of Wisdom, which is basically these wood letters cut up and arranged to spell out some horrible advice. It could be anything as long as the advice was terrible. So uh, we collected these from my friends, and um, we just kind of <laughs> Kept, kept these going. I actually, uh, I've come full circle on this one. I think this is good advice again. So anyways, at the end, I took 
the shapes themselves and uh, turned it into a working typeface. I thought it'd be a nice thing to give to the people that participated in the project. And that turned out to be super fun. And then Lost Type came around, which was a website that offered pay what you want fonts, basically. And uh, I asked if I could put it up on there. The guy, Riley Cran, who runs it, said no problem. And uh, that's kind of who I have to thank for everything that happened subsequently. So I kept on going with <laughs> more typefaces on Lost Type. And it was just super fun. Because you do them, and you draw them. And then they start getting used places. So there was like an exhibition using Edmund Sands or a nice poster from Aesthetic Apparatus using Lavanderia, a mural, and a Ross Dress for Less in Las Vegas, <laughs> which uh, obviously needed some sprucing up. So they went with some wisdom in uh, little sequins or something. Got some dildo stuff. Uh, got some. <laughs> Some rum by Stranger and Stranger. I think that looks actually really nice. Uh, some more condoms and Urban Outfitters. They change their logo like every week, so that doesn't really count. <laughs> Toyota and Disneyland, and it was really exciting to see these things come through. This stuff was not so exciting. This is deeply depressing to me. Um, it's, it's using fonts that really aren't quite ready for prime time in uh, the most indelible fashion imaginable. That Lorem Ipsum one in particular really gets me. But uh, someone, someone's walking around with that on them right now. It's... <laughs> After my undergrad, I was very fortunate to go to Type Media, which is a type design program in The Hague, Netherlands. Uh, it's just a really unique program. It's very tiny. It's super international. It's rare that you get two students from the same country, so now I'm lucky to have a bunch of friends all over the world. And uh, yeah, KABK is the name of the school if you're interested in learning more about that. There's all my buddies in school. I miss them all dearly, except for Frank here, who was, who was there to teach a workshop at this time, and now Frank lives uh, nearby in the Bay Area. I teach type design at CCA now, but in the MFA design department. And I teach also at Type at Cooper West in San Francisco. And there was this thing that just started called Type Thursday, which is a sort of critique group. So we get together once a month and just critique whatever people want some feedback on and drink beer and hang out and talk to each other. And I'm actually really excited about Type Thursday. I think the potential for that to be a really cool club is quite high. So we're going to talk a little bit about work in process. Most designer talks are about work in process, and some people try and disguise it as not that, but I'm not really going to pull any fast ones over on anybody. I'm saying we're talking about work in process tonight. So I run Ono Type Company, which is a one-person type design or type foundry, basically. I often say we, like we at Ono when I talk about it, which is complete bullshit. It's just me. <laughs> uh, when you have your own thing, you get to draw as many logos as you want, which is very fun. And uh, just a couple typefaces out right now. Hobo would be one, H-O-B-E-A-U-X, uh, not H-O-B-O. And um, Victor Script, which was a collaboration with Eric Marinovich, the esteemed lettering artist, also in San Francisco. Lettering is a great thing to have going along at the same time as the type design projects, because those take like a year and a half or three years or whatever. And lettering can be like one day. Like you can knock out a job really quickly sometimes, often more like two or three weeks, something like that. But I think it's nice to have a balance. And I recently did a project where we had to do 25 or so hand-lettered script logo type. So they were scripts so that they would all family in one way or another. And uh, I thought it would be kind of a challenge to get a variety in that many different things. But at the end of this, I started feeling like I was just scratching the surface on what you can do with a script logo. There's just so many options. And I'm a big logo type guy. I'm a lover of logo types. So that was a fun project. I also like typeface families that behave in unusual ways. So this was one called microwave that basically answers 
uh, the age-old question of what happens when you put type in a microwave. Uh, it gets hotter and starts melting, maybe. And then it might burn or uh, completely explode. But I'm interested in the way that they work together just by sharing certain proportions, but not all of them. They can kind of family in a unique way. I also do the expected families. Um, and I also do some bizarre shit sometimes. This was, I wanted to make the best blood drip font ever. And I, I love blood drip fonts, but they're mostly terrible. So I thought if I made one that actually dripped, that would be great. So this. <laughs> But it was taking way too long, so I stopped it. <laughs> uh, this is a very common question, and probably the worst thing anyone can hear. Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer, but we might as well talk about it. I think I'm definitely inspired by all the internet visual research that you do, uh, and all these little images you collect as you go about your life on a computer. I would say, especially to the students in here, it's very valuable to collect all these things and catalog them. So I use Evernote so I can tag everything, and then I have a searchable database of every little image that I've liked. So I can just type in script or two color or letterpress or whatever, and uh, that's a very handy tool for me. We're talking practical advice tonight. <laughs> But it's also a bad idea because it's the same shit that everyone else is looking at, basically. What's a little bit better than that is to look at the real world and take photos, collect your own photos. That's a much more personal thing to you. Also important to be inspired by things that are not just visual. This is a book that I'm <laughs> obsessed with. <laughs> My girlfriend's looking at me like I'm an idiot right now because I've tried desperately to get her to adopt the principles <laughs> mentioned in this book, and it's not working great. Uh, this, is a, this is a great book about um, organization tips, something that I'm clearly passionate about. Uh, so I recommend reading it and letting it inspire you. I'm also very inspired by music. Who isn't? But this band in particular, Wolfpack, is the best band in the world. You heard it when you were coming into the lecture, whether you noticed or not. And uh, I thought I would tell you the story about how I got the coolest job I've ever gotten in my life. Uh, that, that it came from Wolfpack. OK. So we start at the Roadway Inn, which is a really <laughs> shitty hotel, uh, like, like a very bad hotel in Rohnert Park, California. I was coming back from a wedding with my roommate at that time. We were driving. She says, put on some music. I say, great idea. So I consult my Discover Weekly at that time. And I come across a band that looks a little interesting with a slightly weird name. So we put it on. And it's like the best thing I've ever heard in my life. And we're looking at each other like, do you believe what we're hearing right now? This is amazing. Every song was just so good. And it was a relatively contemporary band. I think at that time, their most recent album came out like a month early. So we were like, well, let's just see if they're perhaps touring, if they're maybe playing in San Francisco sometime soon. So we check it out. And as luck would have it, they were playing that night in San Francisco, which is clearly divine intervention. So we go to the show, and it obviously becomes the best show of our lives. And after that, in the next you know nine months, a year, I get increasingly obsessed with this band. And I realize that their influences are things like Motown, all these songs I really love. Um, different artists that they collaborate with or do covers of are people that I'm especially fond of. So I just get deeper and deeper into this world. Even like the instruments they play are th instruments that have awesome logos, first of all, and second of all are instruments that like I really like. I had one of these in high school. So I get so into it that I feel the need to uh, use one of their tracks for a video about the type design process.
get the idea. All right, so you heard the, the music. It's very nuanced, it's super funky, and I was just the hugest fan ever. Then one day, boom, email from the band leader saying, hey, I've been thinking about a Wolf font. Wolfpack would be the name of the band. One weight, bold, monospace, based on the IBM Selectric Italic, I've been using Lacrima and Pitch, oh no, Wolf Collab, let me know if it's interesting, no ex expiration. Oh my God, I was jumping up and down in my room for a solid minute. There are a number of things going on in this email that are very interesting and I'd like to point them out to you. First of all, he has set his little profile image to guess who, Stevie Wonder. Second of all, I've been thinking about a Wolf font. A Wolf font. What musician thinks about custom type? It never happens. One way, bold monospace. He's using type lingo that's like correct and legit. He says, based on the IBM Selectric. Okay, that's a typewriter that came out years ago. It's very rare that anyone roughly my age would even know, would have any working knowledge of the history of typewriters. Uh, he's been using Lacrima and Pitch. Those are two typefaces that have come out within like the last five to ten years, definitely. And um, they're from good foundries. He says, oh no, Wolf Collab, let me know if that's interesting. No expiration. Clearly the dude is chill as fuck. I was psyched. <laughs> So there's the IBM Selectric. It was a very cool typewriter and a huge technical achievement at the time because you could type faster than it could actually print. It had memory. Um, it also had these little balls, these little fonts where you could interchange them and, and use different styles in the same typewriter. Those were like two revolutionary things at that time. It's just the most bitchin' looking thing. It's got a cool name. Uh, it's, a, it's a great piece of machinery, and they made them for many years, and they sold like crazy. These little balls are um, pretty easy to come by now on eBay and stuff, too. They had the classic fonts that you would kind of typically expect on, uh, on a typewriter, like Letter Gothic or whatever. But they also had this obscure one, this like weird thing that people weren't so used to seeing called the light italic, which is strange that they would do something so sort of whimsical feeling, like the ball terminals are huge and certain details just feel really funky and, and fun to me. And it was obviously a, attractive to the band leader as well. So that was what he wanted to use as inspiration for the band's custom typeface. I immediately start sketching and just do a quick logo like, well, you know, you got to start somewhere, so just just start and, and get going. But you have to be a good little sketcher and sketch all the possibilities. So do as bold as you can, as light as you can, as wide and as narrow as you can. So you're hitting all the extremes so you know exactly how much to back off and where you want to go. Kind of the leave no stone unturned method of sketching. One quick note about sketches. These are a list of four things that they don't need to be. <laughs> so anyways, I'm going along and I, I sent him a very long, thoughtful email uh, about what's going on in each of these individual sketches and all these uh, detailed descriptions. And he says, ooh, that initial logo is it. Go with that. And then three exclamation points. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, after you spend a long time on an email and then you get like one sentence back, it's always like, oh, okay, but whatever. <laughs> I, I had enough to go on. But tracing drawings is a really interesting process and uh, it's very easy to just put straight lines over things and to use a sort of geometric approach. Uh, I, I feel like that often leaves drawings or, or the, the new version, very stale and lifeless feeling. And the name of the game is getting as much life into the vectors as, po as you possibly can. So I would, uh, instead of doing something like this, I would do that. Ooh, what a revolutionary change that is. Let's zoom in on the top of that square. So we're doing that instead of that. 
and I know what you're thinking. <laughs> you're such an asshole. This is the most minute change. But I'm telling you, these small changes that get echoed through every curve or every straight line in the typeface, it tends to kind of build up to a nice effect that feels a bit more nuanced and a bit more human and is thus a better reflection of the music that it's supposed to fit with. So spacing with the monospace thing is completely bizarre. If we're going to space a normal proportional typeface, what we'll do is to take a standard letter. The most normal letter would be the lowercase n because of its two vertical stems. Put two of those next to each other and sort of equalize the space within the letter and outside the letter. So you can chop off the top and bottom and get a nice little picket fence rhythm happening there. Once you've done the N, you got all these other normal-ish characters figured out pretty much, which is uh, really nice. And, and things are moving along quite quickly until you realize, what do you do with this stuff? Well, you just kind of put it between two ends and difficult. You can work that up in like a, a day or a couple days, maybe a week tops. But I realized as an italic on its own, it wasn't so interesting. I think uh, I thought it would be fun to try and put all the flavor of that light italic into a Roman as well, because that didn't really exist. But then you got to do capitals and lowercase. But that kind of gives you enough stuff to play around with and test. And hopefully at this point, you're matching the weight between the italic and the Roman. But then I was like, oh, to have one weight, that's kind of boring. Like, what can we really do here? So I went to the light, and I went as black as I could possibly go, this idea of pushing extremes. And then you got to do that for, of course, the Roman as well. Just a handful of letters, you can test a typeface pretty quickly if you're kind of clever about it and reorganize those letters to create a bunch of different words. Kind of gives you like a, a prototype of a typeface. And then you can throw out that middle weight, because all you really need are the extremes. And everything in between, you can just kind of blend together. And then you start adding in punctuation, and things start looking a bit more legit, like an actual typeface. I don't think graphic designers tend to realize how much uh, time it takes to really flesh out a character set. There's all these weird things, weird punctuation, like dagger and double dagger, and uh, they're fun things to draw, but it takes a lot of time. I am not sure any of the yens, this character, have ever been used <laughs> in history. I don't know how many Asian financial reports are, are looking to my typefaces, but <laughs> if, they, if they need to, they're there. Since it was a band, and they're a very musically literate kind of band, um, I thought it would be fun to just do the musical notation stuff. It's not uh, actual, actually meant for musical notation. They're just more to be used as dingbats. And of course, the band logo. And what fun is it if you're not going to do it in all the weights? So <laughs> we, we have the uh, extra bold treble clef for anyone that needs to use that. And then at this point, you know, you can kind of start designing with things, just playing around and making specimens. And that's where we're at. This is coming out very soon, I, maybe next week or something. I'm not very professional about my, yeah, about my release schedule. But uh, yeah, we, we got to coordinate with the band and stuff on that one. All right, let's see how we're doing on time, because I got, we can do one more case study, no problem. Great. Um, something near and dear to my heart um, is hobo, and I especially adore novelty styles of typefaces like the snow covered, the log, the blood drip, um, you know, script typefaces, of course, cats, you know, that's a very important, <laughs> often overlooked. <laughs> I haven't seen one cat typeface come out of Heffler & Co., so <laughs> very disappointed. Hobo has actually very interesting roots as an Art Nouveau typeface. This is uh, it printed by metal type in the 1923 American Type Founders specimen. And it's just like so dope. 
You can see Hobo's influence on certain poster artists like Wes Wilson, who is clearly working very Hobo-esque uh, in the early 60s and then takes a bunch of acid and gets much more experimental with it. The current working uh, versions of digital Hobo leave a whole lot to be desired. Um, if you can just look at that ampersand and see how bold and clumsy and filled in it is, it's like a scan of a fax, of a photocopy, of an auto trace. <laughs> and uh, these, these curves just deserved a bit more attention, I thought. And there are all these shitty versions floating around that just did the job as poorly as one another. The G, which is the coolest letter in Hobo because it doesn't descend, you know, it doesn't go below the baseline at all. It's like the most amazing thing. But look at those shitty drawings. <laughs> the weird flat spot on the L. Like, Hobo shouldn't have any flat spots in it. That doesn't seem like Hobo to me. Or these weird little euros. This person didn't love their job. I can assure you that. <laughs> And the at symbol. I got to give it up to Bitstream here for just saying, fuck it. We're, <laughs> we're giving them the default at symbol, and they're just going to. This would be Hobo. Now Hobo has uh, gone from a metal font to a photo font. So it has somehow, be, despite no one liking it, <laughs> it has uh, survived a major leap in technology, which is amazing to me. There it is in the photo lettering one-liner. So I just started working on reviving it, trying to kind of get the normal weight going, give it these characters that it was missing, and uh, uh, just tackling the job like someone who kind of gave more of a shit and uh, experimented with more weights and, of course, language support. If you're going to be putting out digital type nowadays, it's very common that they should support Western and Eastern European languages. And I love the non-descending the, the non, um, letters. But in case you want to use actual descending letters, you can do that as well. So anyways, you can do that with the non-lining numbers. This was an idea from Jackson Cavanaugh from OKType to do non-descending, non-lining figures, which is one of the dumbest ideas I've ever put into a typeface. <laughs> Fun things like ornaments that kind of bring it back to these Art Nouveau roots. And yeah, all the punctuation. And finally, you kind of get a nice little product there. But I love luxury. <laughs> so here's a picture of me in my 1995 Lexus LS 400. I sadly don't own the car anymore. I had to donate it because it was in such disrepair. But it was a very luxurious uh, automobile when I was driving it. Here's another one of me and my Lexus. God, it was such a great car. Um, so anyways, I was, I was basically interested in the idea of combining high-end luxury with hobo. Because what's going to happen there? I don't know. It's going to be interesting, though. Um, taking a look at some contemporary super high-end, luxurious-feeling display typefaces from very esteemed foundries, um, like Obsidian from Heffler & Co. on the left and Dalla Prisma from uh, Commercial Type on the right. They're doing some really smart stuff, which is applying some pattern of, or treatment or lighting effects depending on what's going on in the stroke of the letters. What's not happening is this illustration that I did, which shows well, what if they just didn't give a fuck about the stroke that itself and just filled it with pattern? Like, it's so much worse to me than that. It's just like night and day. So these were examples that are achieved through the use of programming. I'm not a huge programming kind of guy, so I thought I could uh, ask myself the question, what could you do that couldn't ever be programmed? What would uh, a computer really not get along with? And I came upon this old typeface called Carlisle Rococo by Paul Car Carlisle back in the photo lettering one-liner. And it's completely insane. I love how insane it is. It must have taken forever. 
and I have not seen it in use ever in my life. Uh, but I, I love it. I thought it was great, and I thought about reviving it, but then I thought, oh, maybe I'll just kind of fuse that with Hobo and see what happens. <laughs> People are laughing. I spent like a year on this. <laughs> and uh, I, I had a project around that same time to do this Beatrice Ward quote, but just experiment with all the novelty styles I could do. So I, I tried them all, and for the very end, the very last word, I just experimented with this kind of Rococo-ish looking thing, and it was super fun. And I loved how the pattern responded to the strokes themselves. So yeah, you can sketch an alphabet pretty quick and just kind of see what you get. Uh, some things are good. You can tell because I wrote good on it, and some things are bad. <laughs> but uh, you figure it out as you go, and these are pretty rough drawings, but things get more refined the more you do it, the more you kind of establish the rules and figure out a system for tackling any glyph. Tracing it was a tough process. It's a lot of points. It's a lot of drawing. Getting that to that takes about uh, an hour if I'm like really going, you know? If I'm really diligent and like sometimes I turn off internet if I really want to get stuff done. So this is no internet. With internet, probably like two and a half hours. <laughs> so yeah, it takes forever. <laughs> uh, but I kind of got here and thought, eh, this is lacking. You know, it, it, it needs more players in the game here. If I can use a sports metaphor, Jess. <laughs> so yeah, having just that, just another layer to put behind it makes a huge difference. And depending on the colors really helps legibility. Having a nice little border, like why not? You know, this is, this is spicing up the typographic palette a little bit. And then something for small sizes as well turned out to be very <laughs> useful. Uh, I named the, this small optical size um, Hobo Rococo Sherman after the type historian Nick Sherman, who's quite a small little guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote a little script that just generates these things so you don't have to manually typeset borders because that's a huge pain in the ass. It's unrealistic that people would use this tool frequently. I understand that. <laughs> but uh, I still think it's fun. And I think we should try to kind of push the envelope and see what new things we can include in packages instead of just the same old series of open type files. So this comes with a little script that operates in a program called Drawbot. If you'd like to learn more about this, I could totally talk to you in private, but it's not so interesting for the group. <laughs> Got to knock out like 25 of these styles to make it worthwhile, basically. They get more ornate as you go. Some are more illustrative, some are just kind of ornamentation. And then this one's like just about to go off the screen here. It's a little too big. And then this tulip one was a throwback to my time spent in Holland. And I, I, after the fact, kind of discovered you could make a bunch of patterns with these, and that's fun too. So I asked my lovely girlfriend if we could use these to make pillows for our couch, and she said, mm, you can make pillows for our couch. That was a yes. That was a yes. <laughs> Look. Who would buy a pillow that looked like that? Somebody? No? <laughs> OK, we got one taker. I'm going to start the Etsy store tomorrow. Uh, but the, here's the point. All these things can hopefully work together, use the borders, use the big type, use the small type to make the stupidest looking end user license agreement that you've ever seen. <laughs> So of course, all of this was a waste of time. I'm not curing cancer. I'm not even a doctor. I'm not even a, a guy paving a road or someone who's useful, like a janitor. Um, but I think still there is something good about doing the stuff that only you will do. Uh, to make work personal is a good thing, not because you're trying to express yourself, but because if you give a shit, you'll just do a better job than anyone else will. So I would encourage you all to do the stuff that only you are going to do and go as deep as you can with it. So thank you so much.
I, I really appreciate you being here. And um, thank you to all the orga organizers at AIGA Colorado. And I'm on Instagram and uh, Snapchat as well if you want to do that. Thanks. So we, we got a bunch of posters. And uh, like I said, there are trivia questions. Is anyone brave enough to answer a trivia question? And they get a nice screen printed poster. Color is quite vibrant. The, the problem with posters is that when you get them at design events, you have to carry them home, which is always a pain in the ass. But uh, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> All right, who's down for trivia? Anybody? OK, we got a taker. Now, are you interested in hearing Wolfpack trivia, Stevie Wonder trivia, or a typography-related trivia question? Hmm, interesting choice. OK, this is kind of a hard one. Though Gutenberg is credited with the invention of movable type, it was actually this inventor operating in China 400 years prior. Sorry, I don't know that one. OK, the, mul the multiple choice answers would be A, Stevie Wonder, <laughs> uh, B, Kyle Reed, C, B, Shang. Or, or D, um, Thomas Edison. I'm going to go with C. Oh, F. There. Give her a hand, huh? Come on up and get yourself a poster. OK, we got some more questions here. Here, I'll let you do that. Uh -huh. Who else is down for typography-related trivia question? OK, someone in the back here. OK. This Denver designer completed an independent documentary film about the linotype machine. I saw the movie. I can't remember his name. You saw the movie. OK, the multiple choice them. answers. Are you ready for them? Yeah. Gary Hustwit, A. B, um, Ken Burns. C, Doug Wilson, <laughs> or D, Aunt Chrissy? Doug Wilson? Yes! Get yourself a poster. OK, I think that might be it for the trivia questions, because I realize I only wrote two typography-related <laughs> trivia questions, and the rest are Wolfpack and Stevie Wonder. So um, yeah, are there any questions? We got one, all right. Go for it. Right here. Um, as an artist, I thank you. Um, as an artist, I generally find myself getting stuck into a general niche. And um, now that I'm out of school, I'm trying to find a way out of that. Do you have any advice based on all of your typefaces are are very different? Uh, yeah, I think making different a priority is good. But um, yeah, the sister Karita Kent quote. Uh, Work is the only, the only rule is work. Yeah, it's just, you're looking at me like, eh, that's shitty advice. <laughs> um, keep, keep going. I think you're probably stuck in a rut because you've let yourself operate in a rut. And, and of course, you want to do what's comfortable. Like, there's nothing that feels better or makes more sense in that moment. But um, that's also sort of like expensive to you in a way to keep going with what you've been doing. Uh, experiment, look at different stuff, and uh, read about people who have done a lot of different stuff I think is great advice. Read biographies or watch documentary films about people that were constantly pushing it. And um, yeah, I think we see a lot of uh, design, art, uh, all kinds of stuff, lettering, where people are doing the same thing over and over. And we got to stop giving those people credit, because it's, it's not so interesting, basically. I think my favorite artists and my favorite musicians are people that have like constantly pushed it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Where did you get the name Oh No from? 
So, should have so great to the question. The microphone so we have that recorded. Oh, the, sorry, go ahead. The second time's always better. <laughs> so where'd you get the name Oh No from? So it's actually capital O, capital H, lowercase n, lowercase o. And those letters are chosen deli deliberately because those are letters used in spacing typefaces. They're kind of like the control characters. You're always putting the, quest the character in question in between those characters. If it's a lowercase letter, it's n's and o's, uppercase h's and o's, h because it's got the two vertical stems. So I just reorganize them, but it's also like, oh no, not another type foundry. Like, <laughs> we clearly don't need more. <laughs> Any, yeah. So I'm obsessed with cursive handwriting, and I changed my signature when I got married after researching like antique handwriting styles. Oh, wow. And I've been told by a couple of my teachers that I need to turn it into a typeface because, quote unquote, there are no good script fonts. Whoa. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> That's what I've been told. I'm still learning. But the thing is, is when I go to change my handwriting from actual writing into vectors, I hate them. Like all of them. <laughs> yeah, that's a great place to be. Okay. It's, it's, uh, if you're not hating it, that would be the problem, okay. I think. Keep going. Just okay. keep practicing to do vectors on a computer, especially if you're really accustomed to hand work. It's yep. like the least intuitive thing ever. But there's a couple of tools um, that can make things a little bit better. I find it's way better to draw in a font program than to draw in something like Illustrator. Okay. Also, there's things that can determine if your curves are harmonious kind of algorithmically. And uh, those things I use, but I just kind of use it as like a second opinion. I don't really take it as the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was years before I had a handle on it. That's a Bezier <laughs> joke. Yes. <laughs> Applause break for that. Uh, no, I just think it takes forever. I don't know. I wish I, I had a, a better answer for you. But read all the articles about how to do better point placement. And um, yeah, maybe if you shoot me an email, I can point you to some resources on drawing curves. Because all the stuff that I've been looking at is like, I'm a student. $700 for software is kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I do understand that. Uh, there are certain student discounts for certain things. Glyphs, I think, has a mini version that's 50 bucks. So I would suggest you checking that out. Cool. And uh, just be patient. Go easy on yourself, especially in those first couple of tries, because it's absolutely brutal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have two questions. Lay them on me. Seth, so, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, all right. So the first one is, you said you were talking about algorithm algorithmically making typefaces? Well, not um, quite. It, it more just analyzes the curves. Maybe I could uh, show you quickly if this would actually work in real time. But basically, each curve has a sort of speed to it. Um, once you line up all the speeds, so you're transferring between curves at the same speed, things are going to look a little bit better for you. So. Eh, this isn't going to go right now, but I can, uh, I can show you a little bit later probably. OK. Um, yeah, so I was mainly asking about Illustrator, and they have a blend tool. Yeah. And I was thinking if, you, if you've ever made tried to create weights using that. That's exactly how we do it completely. Nice. Uh, it's not called the blend tool. It's something slightly different. but it's doing the same exact thing as the blend tool. Cool. And that's how every typeface that you use has probably created all the weights. And things like optical sizes, too. Nice. Mm -hmm. Second question. Whoa, we're getting technical here. Sorry. All right. no, it's what all was the biggest thing you learned in, at The Hague, like when you went to school there? Um, like I was talking about during the sketching, showing the sh sketches for Wolf Mono, they were all about, like, push the extremes as much as possible because you don't know how light is something is supposed to be or how bold or wide or like all these parameters are totally up in the air until you sketch it and look at it. And then you can kind of drag the slider around, so to speak, and figure out exactly where you want to go. So that was 
that was the big thing. And uh, the other thing that I took away from there was being surrounded by other people that are also interested in doing the same thing you are is very valuable. I was like my only type friend in San Francisco before I left. And uh, that doesn't help you get better, really. Yeah. Cool. Kyle, we need you to speak into the microphone to be recorded for posterity. I have a question about hobo. OK. Um, in approaching the hobo project, you basically just were running on passion. What did you, if any, did you encounter legally um, in putting it out as a business? Yeah, great question. No one said shit to me at all. <laughs> uh, no one cared about hobo. I think um, the, the amount of foundries that have a hobo, like Monotype probably has several, Adobe has a bunch, um, URW has a hobo, it's, uh, yeah. It just doesn't matter. It was so old. Uh, so yeah, if you're choosing historical reference, make sure you choose something that no one likes. And, um, and I, just to be safe, I gave it a different name. I uh, considered going H-O-B-O, but um, I thought it was more fun to do a different name and also to just kind of sidestep the issue entirely. And I, I trademarked my name, so yeah. Um, yeah. Doug. Yeah, so I got a question. Um, what has been the reaction of more established type designers to the stuff that you've actually released? Because it's fun, which is great, but like maybe not commercially viable. So what, like, have people said like, oh, you're just a dumb young kid? Or they're like, do like what you're doing? Um, I think it's both. Of course, I don't hear it when they say you're just a dumb young kid. They probably say that to their buddies and um, have a real good laugh about it. But uh, they have been extremely gracious to me. Um, even like Heffler emailed me and was just like, hey, I love Hobo. Like you did a great job with it, which means a ton, of course. But also, he's like, hey, you're not encroaching on my style at all. Like that's cool with like, keep, keep doing your thing over there, whatever you want. Um, so. Yeah, I've, I've had a, a lot of my heroes like, like uh, say nice things, which is, which is always really, really fun. But um, yeah, not something that we should seek out, really, I think. All right. I have a question. Lay it on me, Mike. So when I was doing my research on you, I came across a naked photo of you on the <laughs> internet. Yes. How many other type designers have naked photos of themselves up on the internet? Well, Sackmeister's got the real naked stuff. And uh, I had my sketchbook covering my genitals. Um, the, the, the bigger question is everything about marketing fonts and marketing yourselves as a designer, I think is very vanilla. And it gets very boring. Like if you look at fonts.com, it's just like, oh, who gives a shit? Like, this is doing nothing for me. But if you go to certain boutique foundries, particularly like uh, European guys, like Nikolai Jurek has Typo 9 underwear, um, amazing stuff that uh, is super original. So I just got it in my mind that I uh, wanted to try and experiment with different stuff. And yeah, a naked picture of myself is not something that's a big deal to me. And um, the, the bigger idea is just trying to get people to look at it a little bit different, you know? And say like, okay, we don't have to do business as, us as usual all the time if we don't really feel like it. Um, yeah, that's it. Shall we do a raffle? Yeah, raffle it up. So this will be for the, uh, it's a $20 gift certificate to um, the Tattered Cover. So we thank them for that. Okay, number 5853294.
Whoa, look at that. I never win any. Not today, Mr. Wilson. All right, so you should chat with Pat here and she'll get your info. So the, the next is for the, uh, the Designers Foundry um, typeface, $100. Uh, $100 at on. the Designer Foundry. 5853277. Whoa! All right. Did so you ask did your you question as well? I did. You didn't? Okay. And then, it's okay. I thought we were two for two. Right. And then, uh, what, what are you auctioning off? What do you want to um, put on the spot? I'm, I'm going to do uh, a free Ono font of your choosing. If you're smart, you'll choose an expensive one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and before I say the thing, uh, also, everyone here, if you type in uh, the coupon code, you can get 25% off whatever you buy. The coupon code, <laughs> coupon code is 420 forever uh, with, a, <laughs> with a number four and not F-O-R. 420 forever. Okay, the winning number is 585-3289. All right. There it is. All right, so you should, everyone to Pat. And, and if you ask a question, come up and get a poster. I'll I'll give out uh, five. I have five. <laughs> yeah, we could maybe just bum rush the stage if you want. No, are, are there any final remarks you want to? I don't think so. No, I'd just like to thank you for coming out, and uh, it was a pleasure having you.